Right, so we are on our way through muscle contraction, dealing with some of the anatomy, dealing with some of the physiology on how this whole process comes together. What you're looking at here is the thin filament, primarily consisting of actin, but then you have these regulatory proteins that are called troponin and tropomyosin. So those are the proteins that help out with that regulatory process. And then down here on the bottom are the myosin filaments with their myosin heads. And we have to create a, a connection between the thick and the thin filament between the myosin and the actin in order for that sarcomere to go through that short process. And that's really where we're going to pick up today is talking about that myosin and actin interaction. Now, we want to take a look at myosin and actin and how they interact in two different ways. First, how, does, how the myosin and the actin interact when the cell is not being stimulated to contract, and then look at it when it's being stimulated to contract. And we'll start with the unstimulated cell. So the unstimulated cell, we basically don't have a nerve signal coming in to help with the influx of calcium into the cell. So cell is at rest. When the cell is at rest, the actin and the myosin cannot bind up. And the reason that is is because actin is covered by, my, by tropomyosin. And tropomyosin is just simply this long filament-like protein that you can see here. And it just lays over those active sites, those binding sites, on the active molecule where tropomyosin normally can, can bind to. So literally, this is just a, a, a block or a hindrance to myosin actually being able to make contact to those binding sites on the active molecule. So myosin heads cannot grab onto the active. Tropomyosin sits over the groove of the uh, actin molecule where those binding sites are, and it's also attached onto these molecules called troponins. So tropomyosin is bound to this protein called troponin. The thing that's interesting about troponin is troponin has a binding site for calcium. So hopefully this is beginning to come together. When you get the nerve signal into the muscle cell, it causes a massive inflow of calcium into the cell. Troponin has a binding site for that calcium. So if calcium levels are low, there's no calcium to bind to troponin. Calcium levels are always low in a cell when the cell is unstimulated. Now what happens if we stimulate a cell? So when we stimulate a cell, we have all of that, all of those things that happen. We have the signal that comes down the nerve and causes acetylcholine to release into the synapse. Acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptor, which causes sodium to rush into the cell. That signal moves along the muscle cell down the T-tubules. It interacts with a group of receptors. One of them is called the riantidine receptor that causes an increase in calcium into the cell from two locations, the sarcoplasmic reticulum and from the external, uh, from the extracellular fluid in the external of the cell. So calcium level, calcium levels in the cell are going to increase when we stimulate that cell. Again, brackets mean concentration, so you read this as the increase in concentration of calcium 
results in troponin being bound. So troponin can bind calcium when calcium levels are high in the cell. Calcium begins to bind up on that troponin molecule. Now, troponin is a protein, right? What happens whenever you bind a protein to something? I gave you the, analysis, uh, the analogy of a baseball. You catch a glove or catch a ball, that glove, that baseball in its shape changes, and that changes the function of that glove, right? Troponin is a protein. When we bind calcium to troponin, that calcium causes troponin to change its shape. Now, the shape and the function of troponin is to end up pulling on the tropomyosin to move the tropomyosin away from those binding sites. So ultimately, when troponin is bound by a high level of calcium in the cell, we result in a functional shift where tropomyosin is induced to flex. It flexes away from those active binding sites. So if I were to redraw this in a little bit simpler detail, the circles represent actin. Normally, those binding sites are blocked by tropomyosin that's attached to troponin. Now we have calcium that comes in and interacts with the cell. In green here is what happens after calcium binds. We have the troponin and the tropomyosin that flex out of the way. Now the heads of the myosin molecule can actually access those binding sites on the active molecule. Does that make sense? So we're just simply moving the tropomyosin out of the way. Now we can get in there with our myosin head and we can begin to bind to that active. And this is just like the tug of war. Once myosin grabs onto that active, it's going to pull on. Myosin is, uh, as it's pulling on the active, is pulling the whole sarcomere into a shortened combination. So myosin binds to actin. The last ingredient that we need here to make, once the, the myosin grabs onto actin to make that myosin flex, to make it move, so we just need energy to do that work. In our energy supply to make that movement of flexing the myosin head work, anyone kind of guess on what the molecule we're going to use? We're going to use ATP. And why are we going to use ATP? Because we use ATP for everything. That is our energy currency in the cell. That's how we pay for energy inside of the cell. So quite a bit going on in this picture, but this is just the cycle. It's basically showing when the cell is stimulated, how do we go through that process of shifting that active molecule to shorten the whole circuit. It's known as the power stroke, and it's going to happen in this cyclical pattern through all muscle contraction. And basically it's kind of like biasing, grabbing on a movie, and it reaches out and grabs again and can use the... Uh, start your shorter and shorter as it goes through multiple multiple power strokes to shorten the circuit. So when energy becomes available to flex the myosin head, the head goes into this flexed position. That's a high energy position. It's it's a it's basically sort of like loading the actin in myosin molecules so that they can move. So they go into this. Um, flexed position, it's a high energy position, and they form a cross ridge. And the cross ridge is that interaction between the myosin head and the actin film. As long as myosin head is not bound, the myosin head is not bound in the actin, we're not forming a cross ridge. The cross ridge is actually that interaction between the actin and the myosin head, where the myosin is now physically attached to the actin. And it's in this flex state that's a really high energy flexed state. 
as all of this happens, the myosin itself has a site for ATP. So you can see ATP gets loaded on there, and it breaks ATP apart. That's called ATP hydrolysis. That's just the term we use to describe breaking that ATP molecule apart. Whenever you break down a molecule in a chemical reaction, you're gonna you're gonna have some sort of exchange of energy. Okay. So by breaking ATP, we're shifting the energy that's stored in ATP to the myosin head, so the myosin head can actually do work. That's supposed to be great. So the head flexes in response to the breakage of the ATP. You get energy liberated from the ATP. This is enough to cause that myosin head to go to that flex type. Um, High energy position binds up to the uh, actin molecule, and then we go through a work cycle, or sometimes also referred to as the duty cycle. This is the process of going through and moving the actin molecule relative to its original position. And it looks very similar to rowing a boat. That work cycle is what we actually properly would call the power stroke. So in this figure, myosin starts out in the low energy conformation, and it can't bind up to the myosin head. Calcium levels, if they're high in the cell, myosin troponin move out of the way, making way or giving access to the active molecule from myosin. When ATP bonds, binds up onto that myosin head, it goes through this process of breaking it down, which converts it into this high energy position, which is what you're seeing going on here. So we go from that low energy position to this high energy position as we've broken the ATP apart. So we get the energy out of the ATP, and we use that to connect up with the active molecule. Then the ADP and the inorganic phosphate, which is what's left over from the ATP, those are parts of the ATP that we've just broken apart. As those release, we now have to go back to our low energy state. And in the process of going to the low energy state, from the high energy state to the low energy state, the molecule as it goes back to that position is when it actually pulls on the active molecule as it's going from that high energized state to that low energy state that we have down here. So we call this part right here where we're actually moving the active molecule as we shift from our high energy state attached to the active to the low energy state free from the active, the power stroke. Now this power stroke or our whole work cycle or our duty cycle is going to occur continuously as long as there is a nerve signal. So as long as there is a nerve signal, we're going through this process continuously. And this active molecule is being slowly moved or being moved relative to its original position, shortening that whole structure we call the sarcoma. The work cycle will cease when the nerve signal stops. <clears throat> so when we lift that nerve signal, we are no longer going to have this cycle occur. Now, just because the nerve signal stops does not mean that the sarcomere lengthens back up. So right now, all of this that I'm describing is occurring in my bicep muscle as I flex my bicep. I'm going to get to a point where I'm no longer decreasing that joint angle. At this point, the nerve signal has stopped, but the sarcomere are in their ending position, right? They shorten, and they're still short. So just because that nerve signal stops this me, I go back to my original position. The nerve signal has stopped here. I have to use another muscle to bring these muscles, these sarcomeres, back to their original positions. So don't be confused that when the nerve signal stops that you just go limp. Really, you just no longer have that work cycle that's occurring in that particular muscle. 
So why, when we stop the nerve signal, does this power stroke stop? Remember, we need the nerve signal to maintain high levels of calcium in the cell. So when the nerve signal stops, we actually decrease calcium influx into the cell. And in addition to decreasing calcium influx into the cell, we actually begin to pull that calcium back out of the cell, pack it away into the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and kick it back out into the extracellular fluid. So calcium levels, as soon as the nerve signal stops, calcium levels drop. They're no longer high inside of the cell. What is calcium doing in the cell? When it's high, it's binding to what protein? Trophodin, it causes trophomyosin to be moved out of the way. Now, I don't have high levels of calcium in the cell. What happens to the troponin? It's no longer binding to the calcium, right? So if troponin is no longer binding to the calcium, that trophomyosin has to go back to its original conformation, which is to cover up the active sites on the active molecule. The SR here stands for the sarcoplasmic. So inside of here, kind of in your mind, put in a whole bunch of calcium. Calcium is interacting with the troponin of the tropomyosin to expose those active sites. Calcium levels drop. I no longer have calcium to bind to the troponin or the tropomyosin, and so the troponin tropomyosin go back to their original position over the active sites of the active. And now I can no longer bind the, the myosin head to the active molecule. So clear as mud. So it's taken back up into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So calcium gets picked back up in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Let's go back to this picture. So this is kind of a whole context. As the signal comes down the nerve, that signal causes acetylcholine to be released here into the synapse. Acetylcholine binds the receptors that are found in the muscle's membrane. Those receptors, the acetylcholine receptor opens up. The sodium begins to rush into the cell. That sodium sends a signal out along the cell into the T2. <coughs> That signal is going to trigger the sarcoplasmic reticulum to become permeable to calcium. Calcium is high here in the sarcoplasmic reticulum, it's low here in the intracellular fluid. Calcium begins to rush into the cell. So, that whole first part there, the big take home message, is the nerve signal needs to release some calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Is everybody with me? The nerve signal is responsible for releasing calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. This causes an increase of calcium in the intracellular fluid, the cytosol of the cell. So nerve signal leads to large amounts of calcium in the cell. That calcium is going to go to our sarcomere, which is our organized myosin and actin filaments. This is what it looks like really close up with the sarcomere. This is our actin and this is our myosin. Think of actin as being a rope, and myosin just being hands that are going to pull on that rope. If I was strong enough and I had a rope attached to that wall, I could pull the wall towards it, right? That would shorten the distance between myself and the wall. The myosin is going to grab onto the actin and it's going to pull on it and it's going to pull the sarcomere, the whole sarcomere that that actin is attached into, and it's going to pull it together to short. We don't want that to happen all the time, so I want to regulate when that becomes possible. We only want to have that happen when we have a high nerve signal. And what happens with our high nerve signal? So I just told you, our nerve signal causes what to happen to the cell. High levels of calcium. That calcium interacts with this protein right here called troponin. 
calcium binds up to the troponin whenever you bind the protein. So one of the rules that you have to know about biology is that when you bind a protein, when you, when you attach something to a protein, that protein changes its shape. And shape always defines the function. And what I mean by that is the door is closed right now. The shape of the door defines that I can't get out. What do I have to do to get out of this room? I have to change the shape of the door. I have to swing it open. So the shape always defines the function. If I bind up that triple, uh, the troponin of calcium, it changes its shape. And its shape defines the function. Its normal function <coughs> is to help secure tropomyosin over the binding sites on the app. When calcium binds to troponin, it's changing shape is to pull that tropomyosin molecule away from the binding site on the active. This creates a situation where myosin now can bind up and it can go through that tug of war process. That's actually a very different process. Uh, it, it, it's um, it's actually not even related to your muscles at all. The short answer is called cavitation, and it's a change in pressure that releases gas that can dissolve inside of the synovial fluid. So whenever you change, whenever you change volume, you change the gas pressure. Um, think about a, uh, a balloon. If I squeeze on the balloon, I'm decreasing the volume. What does that mean? The pressure inside the balloon it increases it because they're inversely related. So then if I release that pressure, what happens to the, to the pressure? Or if I release the, the, the volume, what happens to the pressure? It goes down. So when you crack your knuckles and pop your bones, that sound is actually the gas that's being released. So it's very different from this. My question and answer here is. So calcium in the cell, it allows that interaction to occur between the myosin and the actin. It causes the molecule to shorten, start from to shorten. If I get rid of the calcium, troponin and tropomyosin go back to their original native conformation, the original position, covering up the active sites, the binding sites on that actin, and the myosin no longer can get in there to pull on it. So you're limiting the ability to go through that tuck of war process. <coughs> I am going to move on. If you're still struggling with the details here, one, chances are you're making this far more complicated than it really should be. Two, I'm in my office, and you can stop by and talk muscle contraction all day long. What I want to talk about now is supply and energy. You'll remember from this figure here that we needed ATP. Right? And we're going to break that ATP apart. So if I were to grab one of your cell phones and smash it on the ground, I'm breaking your cell phone, you got to go get a new one, right? We have to regenerate that ATP supply just like if we break something, we have to go and get a new cell phone. So ATP has to be continually supplied in the form of ATP because it's going to be broken down. So we have to continually regenerate that molecule. And that's what we call supply and energy. So in this process of muscle contraction, that myosin splits the ATP. It breaks the ATP apart. And it breaks it down into two components, a molecule called ADP and a molecule called inorganic phosphate that I'm going to abbreviate as PI. ATP breaks down to ADP and PI. If I take ADP and inorganic phosphate and PI and put them back together, I reach for ATP. And that's what we have to do. So we have to regenerate. So regeneration of that ATP molecule is going to be required. So basically, when we look at the chemical reaction, 
we have to, we're going we're gonna to take ATP and split it up. And then we have to take those two components of ADP and PI and we have to put them back together as ATP. So we can split them up again. Because this is where our energy is held. And by breaking it apart, we release that energy so that it's useful. We rely on three different systems to supply our energy or our ATP to regenerate our ATP. Typically referred to as energy systems, and you're probably familiar with at least two of them, if not all three of them. Um, in fact, I would bet you probably are familiar with components of all three. So we'll go through all three of these, the phosphogen system, the glycogen lactic acid system, and the aerobic respiration, or cellular respiration. Now I'm going to start with the phosphogen system. And you're probably going to be familiar with the phosphogen system by another name. You've probably heard it referred to as the creatine phosphate system. Or at a minimum, you've heard of a molecule called creatine. Remember, you can see it. You go by yourself. It's going to be creatine. And you can start to take that. And honestly, it doesn't do anything for you, but it produces some urine. So, this creatine <clears throat> phosphate system, it's a group of enzymes that help to go through that process. You, you already saw me draw this right here. ATP is broken down to ADP and PI, and then it's put back together. Well, we use this molecule called creatine phosphate to donate the inorganic phosphate that's required to be added to the ADP to produce the ATP. So when I break down ATP, I'm going to grab a phosphate from creatine. I'm going to split the creatine, enzymatically break down the creatine phosphate to end up with creatine and that phosphate, and that phosphate goes back in to generate the ATP. I add this or inorganic phosphate to ADP to produce the ATP. Now, this system is really good at generating ATP, but it's very low amounts of ATP and it gets overwhelmed very, very quickly. So normally when you activate the creatine phosphate system, you can get about 30 seconds. You can get about a 30 second supply of ATP. So ATP is broken down, you're left over with ADP and PI, you pick up more PI from the creatine, add it into the ADP and you get ATP. So really what I'm saying is you're using creatine phosphate as your pool for, phosphate, for the inorganic phosphate. And whenever you need that inorganic phosphate, you are going to kick it into producing ATP for muscle contraction or whatever the work is that you're doing. Only a 30 second supply. You overwhelm the system very quickly. It would kind of be like me standing up here with a big bucket of tennis balls. I start throwing off and I have a dog that goes and fetches them and brings them back very soon. I'm going to out of so we, we run out of high, or we run out of ATP production very, very quickly. Now you know that if you start exercising, you exercise for long enough for 30 seconds. So we must have an alternative system. The next system is called anaerobic fermentation. And this lasts about three to five minutes when it is in full use. Inside of your cells, you have a series of enzymes that break glucose down. Where does glucose come from, by the way? It's what you eat. You get it from your diet. That apple or that drink that you're drinking has got sugar and it's got glucose in it. You consume that glucose and it makes its way into your cells. So that glucose can be broken down to pyru this molecule called pyruvic acid. As you go from glucose to pyruvate, you generate 
four ATP molecules, which is a really low supply of ATP, but it's really quick to produce those four ATP molecules. Now, at the very onset of exercise, if I had you all go off and let's say begin to run one mile, for about the first maybe two to three minutes, you actually are going to inadequately supply oxygen to your muscles. In other words, your muscles are going to be working harder than the oxygen that you can supply because you don't instantly start to breathe real heavy right away when you, when you first start to exercise. Your breathing slowly increases. And as your breathing slowly increases, that's bringing in a better and better supply of oxygen. So for this about first two to three minute time period, you are in a condition where you lack a required amount of oxygen. Anaerobic just simply means without oxygen. When organisms are exposed to low oxygen environments, whether it be at the onset of exercise or maybe you just live in an environment where it's low oxygen, you preferentially convert pyruvic acid into this molecule called lactic acid. See, the way these chemical reactions work is they're kind of like a conveyor belt. If I have pyruvic acid that builds up, it causes all the other reactions to back up. Just like if you go to the grocery store and start loading your groceries on there, and the uh, checkout clerk doesn't have enough time to clear the gro groceries at the front end, pretty soon you can't put more groceries on because everything's backed up. So we have to continually pull this pyruvate concentration down in the cell. We want to basically remove that pyruvate, continually remove the pyruvate, because then the glucose can continually be pushed to pyruvic acid and we get our four ATPs. The way we do that when we don't have enough oxygen is we kick it over to this molecule called lactic acid. Okay? Lactic acid, um, you probably have experienced lactic acid before. It's associated with that burning feeling, sprinting, or heavy, uh, heavy exercise. And you would begin to accumulate the lactic acid, and really the lactic acid will begin to accumulate to a point where you no longer have the ability to push pyruvate to lactic acid. So this whole thing starts to back up. And so we have to shift this someplace else in order to shift this someplace else to need oxygen. So either your breathing has to catch up with the level with the workload, or you have to reduce your workload. You can't sprint forever in other words, right? If I tell you, hey, go out and sprint, maybe we'll be able to sprint 400 meters, maybe 800 meters if you're a really good athlete, but definitely not 26 pounds. So you actually have to slow down your running speed because that reduces your workload. And as you begin to do that, what happens is now you become, uh, you, you gain oxygen, and that oxygen availability shifts pyruvic acid from lactic acid production towards what's called cellular respiration, which is our third type of ATP supply. So it's about a three to five minute supply using anaerobic fermentation. And the reason that we have to use this is because the cell lacks sufficient oxygen. Now, once we've been either forced to reduce workload to match the oxygen supply capabilities of the organism, or we're just given additional oxygen, we can shift away from anaerobic fermentation. We can shift from hydrogen gas to lactic acid towards cellular respiration or aerobic respiration, meaning with oxygen. Now, aerobic respiration typically can be performed for five minutes up to several hours and might even be able to do it for several days, given an adequate supply of glucose from your diet. We preferentially shift to aerobic respiration when oxygen becomes available. That oxygen becomes available either because workload is increased to a more adequate oxygen availability supply, or 
your breathing rate is sufficiently accelerated to move in enough oxygen for adequate aerobic respiration. Now, the thing about aerobic respiration that's really, really beneficial, you can see it right here. You can end up with 34 ATP from a single molecule of glucose as opposed to four molecules of ATP with anaerobic fermentation. So this is a high ATP supplying energy system, but there is a little bit of a trade-off. We can't supply that ATP as quickly as we can in the lower amounts of aerobic fermentation, so we have to reduce muscle contraction. We have to reduce our work. So we can't sprint forever. I would be very satisfied for this class if you are able to give me the three different the three different systems by name, the phosphogen system, anaerobic fermentation or lactic acid fermentation, and aerobic respiration, and give me an idea of when those three systems are going to be used and whether they produce a small amount of ATP really quickly or a large amount of ATP for slow or someplace in between fermentation. Now, before I move on, I, I want to make sure that um, you don't really think, okay, I begin to sprint 30 seconds, creatine phosphogen system. And then from that 30 seconds, I'll do about three to five minutes aerobic fermentation, and then after that, it becomes cellular respiration. All three of these systems, you're sitting in your rest. All three of them, you're utilizing all three of them in all of your muscle systems right now. The uh, ratio of the three is what actually changes. So right now, most of your ATP supply is coming from aerobic respiration, nearly 99%. And then you have a couple of cells where there's small amounts of ATP being produced by the phosphogen system, small amounts of ATP being produced by aerobic fermentation. When you first start out sprinting, that first initial 30 seconds, we shift from cellular respiration or aerobic respiration be the primary mode of ATP production to a much higher amount of ATP being produced by that phosphate system in excess of 99% and then the remaining less than 1% are coming from those two other systems. Okay, does that make sense? So you kind of have this shift in the ratio, not that all three of them happen at different times, they're all happening at the same time, but the magnitude of ATP production for each changes depending on the workflow, the oxygen availability characteristics of the organism. Now there's a kind of a neat effect that occurs at the onset of exercise, and we call it the oxygen deficit. This is a picture of what the oxygen deficit looks like. So here you can see this is time. And this individual participated in about seven minutes of heavy work. So maybe it was they ran a mile or something like that. This on the x-axis, on the y-axis rather, is your oxygen consumption. How much oxygen is your body moving in? Right now you're basically fully made of all 3.5 milliliters of oxygen for every kilogram of your body. It's pretty low oxygen. But as you increase your workload, you need more and more oxygen breathing accelerates, but it takes time for breathing to accelerate. So it wasn't until about four to five minutes before oxygen supply leveled off at an adequate supply for the workflow. So you're left over with kind of this portion of the curve shown here in, in shaded gray, where your oxygen demand from the workload was not met by your oxygen intake for breathing. That's called the oxygen deficit you're left over with a deficit on the front end that has to be repaid, and it's repaid on the back end. So once we've stopped, we actually continue to have accelerated breathing, which brings in additional oxygen as we repay that <coughs> deficit on the front end. And if you take this curve and flip it over, you'd see that it lands right back on top of the, the first part of the curve. The first shaded gray area is basically a mirror image of what we have over here. 
So oxygen deficit, they used to call it the oxygen debt, but it's not a really good description because debts have to be paid back with interest. If I take out a loan, I'll have a debt. And as I go through time, I start paying off that, that debt. It comes with a principal payment and an interest. In this case, because these two things are equal, it's actually a deficit. Deficits are just a shortfall. And when you pay that shortfall back, you don't pay it back with interest. So I don't have additional oxygen that's consumed here to pay off less oxygen consumption, but the lower oxygen consumption on the front end. So that's called the oxygen deficit on the front end. It's paid out back by this thing called the post-exercise oxygen um, uh, uptake. So this deficit is what accumulates on the, at the onset of exercise, and it comes in the form of adjusted breathing, and it takes time to adjust that breathing. I mean, if I tell you, okay, sprint, you instantly are running as fast as you can, but your breathing has to catch up. So muscle contraction can instantaneously begin at a very high work load, but breathing remains low and slowly elevates with time. So your breathing rate adjusts to your workload. During this time, you're also preferentially going to be using things like the creatine phosphate, phosphate system, the phosphate, phosphate system, and also lactate, lactate fermentation. So you'll have accumulation of those products, accumulation of lactic acid. Depletion of creatine phosphate. And also ATP depletion. So we lose creatine phosphate, we lose the ATP, we're accumulating lactic acid. All of these things are moving the organism, those cells, out of their homeostatic balance. So we're going to have to undo the lactic acid. We're going to have to replace the ATP, replace the creatine phosphate. And that's all going to come here when we complete exercise. So basically, at the completion of exercise, we have to go through and, and reverse that lactic acid accumulation. So we want to undo our lactic acid. We want to replenish creatine phosphate. phosphate and ATP. So the next time we have to exercise, we have an adequate supply and storage for both of those molecules. In order to do both of these things, I actually have to shift towards ATP production, primarily coming from uh, aerobic respiration. So I need oxygen. So after you're done with exercise, there's a very good physiological reason why breathing remains high. You can just sit in there just puffing and puffing after you finish up exercise. And you're pulling in that additional oxygen that's, that's needed to replace all of these things and to reverse those buildups that have occurred. So this Increased breathing that continues after exercise is what's actually repaying that deficit that was accumulated at the very beginning of exercise. And we give it a really cool name. And it just stands for excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption. <laughs> 
excessive post-exercise oxygen consumption, or EPOC, EPOC. And EPOC is what you see there in the shaded portion of the, uh, of the back side of the curve after the completion of exercise. And it's a one-to-one -one ratio that that EPOC pays back our deficit. Everybody have all very good. Okay. okay. What I'm gonna start right now and what we'll finish up on Friday, which then will be all done with everything from the first unit exam is muscle movement at the whole muscle level. So not just talking about now what's happening at the level of the sarcomere, but what's happening at the whole muscle. And what we have to identify first here is that movement of muscles is not and cannot always be the same. And I'm going to give you an example of what I'm talking about here. The muscles that you use to pound a nail into a piece of wood are the exact same muscles that you use when you're beating yourself on the floor. It's very important that you do not use the same muscle force to pound a hammer or pound a nail into the hammer as you do when you're beating yourself on the floor. Right? So you have to control the movement and the activation of those muscles for the specific task that you're trying to perform. This is actually primarily going to be dictated by the nerve itself and not the muscle specific. It's going to be the muscle that performs the work, but it's going to be the nerve activity that regulates things like force production or force um, or strength. Level. You need a tremendous amount of force with your hammer. You want far less force with your fork. So we're going to alter nerve activity. We're going to alter how the nerve interacts with the muscle to determine how the whole muscle is going to respond. Now, we briefly touched on this thing called a motor unit. <clears throat> Inside of all of our muscles, we have multiple neurons, multiple nerve cells that interact with bundles of muscles, muscle cells, called motor units. So in this figure here, you can see there are three motor units that are listed out. So this purple nerve fiber here comes down and it interacts with these purple cells distributed throughout the muscle. Whenever this nerve is activated to fire, these purple cells are going to contract. So if I'm feeding myself with a fork, I probably only want to use a small number of those motor units. When I'm pounding a nail into a board, I'm going to want to use a much larger number of those motor units. So by altering the number of motor units that we, what's called recruit, we can change how much force is going to be produced by the muscle. So that motor unit is a group of muscle cells that are associated or attached to one nerve in each of those groups. So I have three motor units there, which consist of three individual nerves attached to multiple muscle cells within that muscle. We'll pick up with the idea of how do we alter muscle tension or the muscle's ability to generate force when we get back here on Friday.